Hello, I'm Lucy Hawkins. Welcome to BBC News Now. Three hours of fast-moving news, interviews and reaction. We start with some breaking news this hour. In the past minute or so, European scientists have said that 2023 left the records tumbling like dominoes, confirming it was the hottest year ever recorded. The average global temperature was 14.98 Celsius. That beats the previous hottest year set in 2016 by 0.17 Celsius. But this is according to the EU climate change service Copernicus. The Met Office in the UK believes this record as well could be short-lived. Their forecasts suggest that 2024 could be even hotter. We are keeping a close eye uh, on the people at Copernicus, who we understand are going to be giving a press conference in the next few minutes or so, just updating us on their research, their evidence as well. That's happening in Bonn. Watching that for us and with me now is our climate editor, uh, Justin Rallop. We were expecting this, weren't we, Justin? We were expecting this. We're expecting a number of other forecasting organisations around the world to confirm the figures that we hear today, that 2023 was the hottest year ever recorded and by a really significant margin. So it may not sound much, but the record was broken by 0.17 degrees Celsius. Now, this is a global average. Normally, you'd expect it to be if it is broken and it, you know, it shouldn't be broken every year. But if it is broken, you would expect it to be a tiny uh, margin, say scientists, 0.01, 0.02, 0.0.17 is a really significant margin. So we, we've seen, I think it's fair to say, records have been smashed. BBC has done analysis of the Copernicus data. Copernicus is the, the climate monitoring organisation for Europe. And we found that 210 days last year set daily global temperature records. 210 days. It's a lot. Justin, can you take us through the science of this? Why is the world... Warm? I mean, it's a complex picture. Underlying it all, of course, is the increase in greenhouse gas emissions produced by the activities of humanity. That's predominantly carbon dioxide, but also methane emissions are, uh, are increasing. So those are relentlessly driving up temperatures. We've got a couple of extra factors this year. There's a, a, a weather fluctuation called El Nino, which happens in the Pacific and means more water warm water, more warm ocean water is exposed and that kind of gives an extra fillip to global temperatures. So that began to happen at the end of this, this year but, and will continue, is continuing now into this year. So that's one feature. There were some other uh, changes in the uh, uh, amount of dust and particulates emitted into the atmosphere because of rules on shipping and also a volcanic eruption. So that caused some changes. But the underlying, the key story here is that climate change driven by man's activities is is relentlessly driving up temperatures. The really frightening thing is that scientists say 10 years time this will probably look like a cool year. Yeah and it next year the Met Office here in the UK is saying it could be even worse. Justin stay with us we're going to listen in now to the scientists from Copernic exactly. Copernicus who are in Bonn. The art products which combine millions of satellite and in situ observation with model outputs to produce maps without gaps describing the state of our climate for every place on the planet at any hour. Both C3S and CAMS contribute significantly to the information that supports evidence-based policy making, such as the latest IPCC assessment reports. Thanks to the Copernicus free and open data access policy, anyone can make use of the Copernicus satellite and in-situ observations, models, and other products about past, present, and future climate and transform them into useful insights for climate resilience. All European countries need to drive down carbon emissions. And this is an undeniable, uh, tough undertaking. But data from the Copernicus services, such as C3S and CAMS, can play an important role to demonstrate progress towards net zero. Beyond the continuation of the measurement of current parameters, the Copernicus program will also soon deploy new satellites to offer the possibility to monitor CO2 anthropogenic emissions in support of the UNFCCC climate agreement. In closing, I would like to congratulate and thank ECMWF in running C3S and all contributors for, for summarizing these important 2023 findings. And with that, I need back to ECMWF colleagues for more details of the 2023 global climate highlights on C3S. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mauro. And Mauro Facchini will be staying with us for the question and answer session coming later. 
Now to introduce the Copernicus Climate Change Service and its work, I'd like to call on its director, Dr. Dr. Carlo Buntempo, to say a few words. Justin, as we suspected, there's quite a lot of technical you. detail. And no, your no, job, no, after we've finished our discussion, is to go away and listen to all of it yes, and absolutely. pick out all the most important bits from those Copernicus scientists who are giving this news conference. But I heard the word adaptability mentioned there. That's obviously key. Well, What's it, happening in the world at the moment? Well, what I'd what like to just go through some of the highlights of what they, which I assume that they bring at the top, would be highlights <laughs> of what, what they've discovered. We heard that it's a, a temperature record uh, broken by a huge margin. Um, it was one point four eight degrees celsius above uh, the pre-industrial temperatures across the whole year. Remember, at Paris in 2015, the world set a target of trying to keep global temperatures, uh, limit the global temperature increase to 1.5. So we are nudging right up to the 1.5 level. Um, one single year wouldn't mean that we'd breach 1.5. That's a 20-year average, but it certainly shows a direction of movement. Um, 2020, 2023 was the first year on record. Every single day was one degree above pre-industrial, at least one degree above pre-industrial temperatures. Almost half the days were 1.5 or more above pre-industrial levels. We even had two days that were two degrees above pre-industrial levels. That's the first time we've seen margins of, uh, of temperature rise of that sort. So again, telling us the direction of, of, uh, of movement. Every single month from June to December in 2023 20, uh, was warmer than the corresponding year. Even more dramatic figures for sea temperatures. We had an extraordinary Atlantic heat wave right at the beginning of the year that, frankly, climate scientists struggled to explain. And that meant that surface sea temperatures have been at record levels all the way from April through to December. So just to set the picture uh, for, for this year, we've got very high sea temperatures around, across the world going into the new year. And that is one of the reasons why scientists are expecting, as you said, uh, 2024 to be even hotter than 2023. Okay, Justin, we're going to let you go and listen to those scientists and we'll be hearing from you throughout the day. But we wanted to really give you a sense of the effect that this kind of warming is having on different parts of the world. Let's take you to Guy Hedgeco, our correspondent in Madrid, who joins us from there, and Joel Kariungi, who is in Nairobi. Good to see you both. Uh, Guy, I've almost lost count of the number of times in 2023 that we spoke about the heat in Spain and in Portugal across the Iberian Peninsula and the fires as well. And it's really having an effect in your part of the world. Yes, it is. And the UN's Environment Programme says that the Mediterranean region as a whole is seeing temperatures increase 20% faster than the global average. So that's a particular concern in this part of the world. Um, one of the symptoms of that has been uh, heat waves. Um, of course, we saw a series of heat waves across southern Europe and many other parts of Europe um, in the summer of 2023. For example, the Kerberos heat wave, uh, which was uh, particularly fierce and pushed temperatures up to the mid 40s Celsius, for example, in southern Italy. Um, so I mean, that's one of the many symptoms. But we're not just seeing more heat waves or higher temperatures. It's also the case that we're seeing, we seem to be seeing heat waves taking place earlier and earlier in the year. Um, so here in Spain, for example, we had a heat wave last year that, that started in April. So we were seeing temperatures that you would normally associate with midsummer uh, in the mid 30s Celsius um, in April. That had never happened before. And obviously, uh, you mentioned wildfires. That's one of the, the, the many repercussions that we see uh, as a cause of that. Uh, that's been a huge problem here in Spain, in Greece, in southern France, in Italy. But also tourism can be affected by this as well. Again, in Greece uh, last summer, um, the Acropolis monument was closed down temporarily uh, because of concerns about people who were queuing up um, for, to, to see the monument. So there, there are all sorts of um, repercussions caused by this um, that can have many effects, um, some of them social, some of them economic as well. Joel, take us through the effects of our warming climate in your part of the world. Well, Lucy, here in Africa, we have been seeing the real-time effects of climate change and climate-related uh, extreme weather events. A time like this last year, uh, East Africa and the Horn of Africa was experiencing famine and drought. And the UN said that about 27 million people in Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia were facing hunger uh, due to uh, not having enough rains to... Uh, as you know, this is a region that relies heavily on uh, rain-fed agriculture. So we saw real-time 
effects of people going hungry uh, because of famine and drought. And then towards the end of last year, the reverse was happening on the continent. Uh, we were seeing a lot of rainfall uh, through the El Nino phenomenon. We saw many people losing their lives due to floods. Uh, and these are countries where uh, the systems in place are not sufficient in order to address some of the effects that we are seeing uh, on the continent. Uh, south, uh, further down south to South Africa, to Malawi, Zimbabwe. These are also countries that experienced heavy uh, rainfall uh, towards the end of last year. And, and scientists are saying that there's a direct correlation between climate change and what is happening in this part of the world. Guy, it's the EU scientists at Copernicus who have made this announcement. It's long been known in the EU the kind of challenges that global warming is presenting to the, com uh, the continent. But what sort of solutions, what sort of adaptations are taking place in Europe to try and mitigate the heat? Well, Lucy, in many cities we're seeing very specific attempts to try and counter the heat. Um, you know, basic things, for example, like build, planting more trees in cities so that there's more shade for people in the height of summer, more water fountains. Um, it, look at going further north in Frankfurt in Germany, for example, they have these cooling corridors where water's sprayed at pedestrians as they walk uh, along the street. So I think we're seeing more and more initiatives uh, like that. Uh, here in Madrid last summer, for example, um, people were invited um, during the hottest times of the summer to go to public spaces like libraries um, and civic centres uh, during the hottest time of day to escape the heat to, to the places where there was air conditioning because there were concerns about their health. So I think we're going to see more and more uh, initiatives like that, not just in Spain, but, but across Europe. Um, but when you get beyond the cities, of, of course, you have a whole other set of challenges. Um, but out in the countryside, you've got uh, farmers who are affected by this. Here in Spain, there's a massive problem with drought, and that is already affecting harvests. And that presents all sorts of uh, concerns there. Um, so there, there's a lot of work being done at the moment here in Spain to try and work out how to distribute water in a, in a fair and efficient way. Um, outside the cities. And Jules, some huge challenges for people in Africa. Well, uh, the African leaders here uh, have been trying to come up with solutions. They feel that uh, uh, the Western world needs to pay more attention to what is going on on the continent, uh, addressing some of the challenges that we have just spoken about. Last year, we saw uh, Kenya hosting the Africa Climate Summit, and this was basically to harness uh, responses from African leaders in order to best respond to some of the challenges that we are seeing currently. Jill, Guy, good to get your thoughts from your parts of the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget the website as well. If you do go to bbc.com or bbc.co.uk, you will uh, see all the research that has been collated there for you and the latest graphs and figures too. So do log on and take a look. 2023 confirmed the world's hottest year on record.